Hey YouTube, this is Ryan from the Strictly Broken Pro Team coming at you with a deck profile for my Konosuban list uh, that finished first at the Toronto Regionals that happened at the beginning of the month. So I'll quickly just go over the deck list level by level and I'll explain why I'm playing each of the cards and the ratios that they're at. Okay, so here's the list. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty standard Konosuba list, except for the fact that I'm playing Stock Soul instead of a uh, second empty door. Uh, the actual pool of good cards in Konosuba is pretty limited, so it's pretty hard to actually have some like unique or spicy tech choices without making the deck worse overall. So I prefer to build Konosuba more streamlined, play towards the deck strengths, and uh, use the power cards of the deck. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about each card level by level. I'm going to try to not read the card effects itself. I'm going to try to talk more about the actual applications of the card and why I'm running them. So the first card we're going to talk about is uh, the TD Drop Searcher. Uh, the Drop, drop Searcher is in general just a really good profile. Uh, they, throughout the entire game, they, add, they act as an additional copy of any of your power cards. So in the early game, it's a fifth copy of your Resonate Union, or even a fifth copy of your Bunny Girl. Uh, it's essentially a fifth cop uh, fourth copy of the Aqua early play, uh, mid-game. End-game, it's an additional copy of any of your uh, combo pieces that you're missing. Like, overall, it's just a really good card, and it uh, adds a level of selectivity that Konosuba doesn't necessarily have, because a lot of its bosses come from the top four. So overall, it's just a pretty good card. So up next, uh, two of the free runner. Uh, the fact that it's a free runner doesn't matter a whole lot. Uh, free runners are good going first turn one, and that's basically about it. So uh, it's not necessarily the most important effect. What's really important on this card is actually the Ditch the X Salvage. So as I mentioned, uh, Konal Super has can have uh, selectivity issues. So having a having a costless dish out that's also a selective. Uh, tutor from your bin. It's pretty good overall. I like this card. I would consider maybe running more uh, if I wasn't running four of the Swimsuit Mega Mean. Uh, it is just a good card, and then, as I said, it's good going first turn one, so it's worth playing. Um, up next, it's four of the Cheery, or um, on death, the Kotsky on death Azusa, whatever you want to call it. I call that profile Cheery. Uh, honestly, I really like this profile on. I really like this profile a lot. Uh, Check four. Uh, check four on a level zero helps you accelerate your deck state, so you get to uh, your second deck faster. So you're able to have a better compressed deck. You're able to get more cancels, or you're able to potentially get more cancels mid game, uh, as well as fixing your hand for whatever pieces you need early game. So when you open this card, it can help you find your resonate your resonate unions, which help you find more additional cards, and it leads into your combo turn, which leads into your mid game overall. And, Cheery just helps the deck function overall and helps you get to your pieces quicker and have a more consistent game plan. That's why I run four. I think standard lists tend to run two to three, and I used to also be on three, but I just really highly value uh, that free mill and getting into second deck so I can bank on my compression a bit heavier. So that's why I'm running four of this instead of just three. So up next is uh, probably the most important card of the deck, I would say. It's uh, the Resonate Union. This card is the engine of the deck. It's where you get your value from every single turn. It's how you get the value out of the Bunny Girl CXC. It's how you get your pluses every single turn. This card is absolutely absurd. Every single turn, if we have two of two unions out, we have a pay two plus two. If you, even if you have one, you, every turn you have a pay one plus one. And, that's ridiculously good. It means you always have playables every single turn, and you don't need to clock as much, and it means you always have a fairly decently sized hand uh, to, that you can use as fodder for your endgame combo, or even as fodder to uh, use your aqua heal to stock. Very, it's very good. Also, the fact that the other effect of the card is a is a like a pay one clock one Ricky sort of effect into the card that it resonates that it resonates with is. <laughs> pretty absurd. It's pretty absurd. It adds a level of consistency to the deck that the, deck's hope, that the deck desires. So if you get into the turn that you want to start resonate, you're using the resonate effect, and you don't have the 3-2 Megumin in your hand for whatever reason, you don't actually have a lot of proactive ways to get it besides the drop searcher, which is just a one up. So it's not really that good to bank on. So the fact that we have that additional level of consistency to always get the resonate effect off, that's it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty valuable. The when we're running four of the actual resonate megamine itself, uh, 
the uh, the situations where we don't have the target in our hand when we want to resonate don't actually come up that often but when they do the fact that we have an out to that situation is it's good it makes the deck makes the deck pretty consistent the only other interesting thing that we need to talk about with this card is uh, how many cards you need to look at so it uh, it pluses off of top four so when you're in first deck you almost always want to check four your first deck is always the least compressed that you'll ever be in the game. So you want to try to get out of that state as quick as possible so that way you can be in a better uh, better compressed deck and you can actually start trying to bank on your cancels a little bit more. So when you're in first deck, when you use this effect, you almost always want to check four. Almost always. And then you pick whatever card you want from that. As soon as you get out of your first deck, that's when you have to actually start thinking about how many cards you need to look at. So typically, unless we need to actually mill the deck out, uh, you just look at one if it's a playable, if it's just a card in hand, or if it's a card that you can put into your hand, you just take it, and then you deal with it. So sometimes this can lead into uh, turns where you sort of chump, chump attack with cards. You just throw whatever playables you have at your opponent just for attacks. And you have like a suboptimal, I guess, kind of turn. But honestly, the f that's fine for the deck because you're doing it so efficiently. You're not losing out anything doing that, so it's okay. If you look at more cards than you need to at, on second deck onwards with this, you can actually mess up your compression. And you can mill out more climaxes than you want. And that can put you into a worse state than you were in your first deck. So you want to be a little bit more mindful when you use this effect in first deck. So up next, we're playing uh, three of the Snot Aqua. Uh, the main, uh, the primary f uh, function of this card is the fact that it's blue. So it's the card that we almost always want to level uh, to get our blue. We don't really want to level any of the other cards, and if we do end up having to level them, uh, it feels really bad, and it feels like we're almost in a worse spot than we need to be. So we almost always want to level the Snot Aqua instead of one of the other more important blue cards. Uh, the actual effect on the stock, Snot Aqua itself is pretty good. Uh, it can potentially plus you more stock, so when you're in matchups like uh, AOT or uh, Standby Sow, or just like matchups that can wall out your Bunny Girl Union and you can't get the reverses, you can use the Snot Aqua, you can crash her to get your additional stock to uh, plus off of the Resonate Union. So, so it gives you an out to bad matchups for your, for your level 1 combo. Another interesting use case for this card is uh, you can actually play it turn one, and if you hit the stock off the mill, it's essentially like you plus you plus the board anyways because that additional stock gives you a plus one from your from your resonant unions. So it, the fact that we have the, this application means that instead of just like the regular six plusing zeros that we can play turn one, we actually technically have nine, which is uh, pretty powerful. If we go first, we always have a good card to play, and I highly value that. So overall, I think this is a good card. Um, I think it's potentially worth thinking about playing f four. I don't know how I would fit four, but I think four is a fine number for this card. Less than three, I wouldn't do, but four I think is okay. Uh, one other note about this card, the fact that the mill on reverse is mandatory is actually sort of a demerit once you get out of your first deck. So as I mentioned with the union, milling more than you need to in second deck onwards can sometimes be a bad thing. So if you have to use this as a trump attacker, uh, and like you mill out CXs or whatever, you can sometimes put yourself in a worse spot than you need to be, and it always feels bad. So typically uh, with this card, I tend to just fodder it past first deck instead of like play it as an attacker, unless I need the mill to, to uh, mill out of the deck for whatever reason. I'm out of all my climaxes or whatever. So it's something to think about. So finally, uh, the last level zero card in my list is four of the Swimsuit Megamine. So um, I play four mainly because I always want to open this card, uh, unless I'm against specifically sort on a line with uh, the Kirito Clean Cut, I almost always want to play this card turn one as my plus and zero. We also play four because it's the only card at level zero in Konosuba that can actually beat over things. So if you look at the level zero lineup, one of the big issues we have with it is the fact that the power level is so low. We're playing a, a lot of utility cards over like just pure beaters or whatever because we value the utility more than the power. But because we're valuing utility more than power, we can sometimes run into situations where we just simply can't beat over our opponent's cards. And if we can't beat over our opponent's cards, we're essentially giving them free pluses when they 
don't deserve it. And if your opponent gets a free plus, it means that they can push more damage next turn without committing resources. So it always puts you in a worse spot than you need to be. So even though I don't necessarily like this card a whole lot, we, we run four simply because we want to actually beat over our opponent's cards. So I, the reason why I don't like this card, and I thought about cutting it but decided not to, is mainly just because I don't like the combination of effects. So uh, typically, uh, no events or backups is not is a fake demerit, it's a non-demerit, just makes your zeros or whatever the card is 1k bigger than it needs to be. However, uh, the the level 1 anti-change and the 2-3 uh, counter event are are the power cards in the mid to late game of this deck. So if we run into situations where we have this card on board and we can't use them, we're essentially shutting off the, the power cards. We're turning off what makes this deck kind of scary on our, on our opponent's turn, and we're giving our opponent a free turn to just do whatever. If this card's on board, they, they confront with their early plays. They don't care about your anti-change. Um, if this card's on board, they, can, they don't have to worry about your events, so they can just do their finishing turn, uh, do whatever, be greedy with their deck state. doesn't matter. Also, the fact that the second card or the second effect, sorry, on this card can sometimes keep uh, plus this card, it, or keep it keeps it to board. So if you uh, the second effect is when she's reversed, if you mill a level two or higher card, she rests. So typically, that's that's a good effect, right? Yeah, uh, you get a free plus when you when you don't necessarily deserve it or you don't actually earn it, and it, it's good when we're at level zero because it, it keeps the card around, we push more attacks for, with uh, less resources. However, if we're in the situation in the mid to late game where we have to use this as a trump attacker because we don't have another playable for whatever reason, and we hit the coin flip and it sticks, we're stuck turning off our power cards in our hand. And it, it always feels bad whenever that happens. So typically, past level one, maybe even later, I don't like playing this card. Whenever it's in my hand, I consider it a dead card, and I just try to throw it away with whatever effect. That's probably why I think cutting it to three might be okay, but if we run in, if we cut it to three, we run into situations where we won't, or it, it reduces our chances of seeing it in our opening hand, which is where we want to see that card. It's the most impactful, and I don't necessarily like that, so I'd rather just cut my losses with the fact that it's a dead card mid game, a mid to late game, and just accept it for what it is. So that's it for uh, level zero. So next, we're gonna just quickly talk about the level one lineup. So level one lineup is pretty thin compared to what I think people think is a normal level one lineup. We only run uh, eight cards. The first two cards are the the level one bomb from set one. It's just a bomb, which is fine, I guess. And typically, I don't think bombs are very good effects unless they have a second effect that's good. But the fact that the bad matchups for Konosupa are walls, or, or mainly walls in AOT, this card sort of gives us an out to that bad matchup, similar to the, the Snot Aqua. So it's, uh, it ends up being pretty good. But the, the actual, the really the really good effect on this card is the fact that it's, uh, it has hand on core. So if we get into situations where we do our bunny girl union combo and she hits the top check and we add some random level two or higher card to our hand and we cancel and get stuck at level one and don't have playables, we can actually use the cards that the bunny girl uh, add to our hand randomly to convert into attackers efficiently. We can use it to ditch for the hand encore for the bomb and we always have a good attacker at level one. And that's actually why I value this card so much. It gives us a third card to play alongside our bunny girl union that guarantees we always have a good attacker for the next turn. I only run two of this card because I only want to play the one. At level one, I almost always want to play at least two bunny girls, and then the third card ideally would be the bomb in this situation. So I don't think playing any more than two is good unless you want to play more than just the one on turn, then you can start considering running more. It is a good card, running more would be A-OK, -okay, but I only want to play one, so I only play two. So next we have uh, the level one Megamine counter. counter. Uh, it's just a 1k counter. Uh, our cards are weak power defensively, so we don't really use this as a counter. Sometimes we can counter Bunny Girl to 7k, and that's fine, but typically we use this card more so for the anti-change effect. So when we use it, we can discard two cards and we can uh, anti-change. Just send a card who's higher level than our opponent's level to the waiting room. Anti-change is oh, almost always a good effect because it acts as a form of anti-damager if our opponent disrespects us or doesn't play around it. 
Uh, it negates the attack, so we don't have to worry about taking that attack. Uh, it can even negate their stock generation if they have multiple early plays, or if they just don't attack with that early play first. And the fact that it's at level 1 also gives us outs to matchups like uh, Pastel Palette's Bang Dream, which are trying to early play 2-1s at level 1 and get their advantage off of their 2-1 sticky on the board. So the fact that we have this gives us an out to that matchup, as well as giving us an efficient out to matchups like uh, Sunshine, uh, Kono, I guess Konosuba in the mirror, technically. It's not that good in Konosuba. It's mainly just Sunshine. Gives us an out to AOT if they don't have the Hexproof for the Aaron. Just a good... Um, a lot of people don't like the Ditch 2. I think Ditch 2 on any change is actually a perfectly fine cost, but the fact that our pluses are coming mainly from the Resonant Union actually means that this card can read Pay 2 Anti-Change instead of Ditch 2, or can read Pay 1, Ditch 1, like whatever, any combination you want. And Pay 2 Anti-Change in a deck that's uh, mainly trying to uh, plus from stock or like just increase its stock generation is just always good. It's just a really good card. The final level 1 card we're, that we're running is just the Bunny Girl Union. It's the climax combo of the deck. There isn't really a whole lot interesting to talk about with this card. It's a climax combo. It's what we use to feed the engine, the Resonate Union, and carry us through the mid game. We want to play multiples of it, so we play multiples of the, con the combo. Um, play 4, try to see it in our hand as fast as possible, so that way uh, as soon as we hit level 1, we're always ready to go with our climax combo. Good card overall. Um, I guess the the only thing that you really need to talk uh, need need to consider is the fact that its demerit can sometimes be a problem, or sorry, not demerit. Uh, the the power effect can sometimes be a problem. So it's only six k if your entire board is magic or like red. None of the blue cards in the deck actually are magic. So if you run into a situation where you have to play an aqua to just have a third attacker with your bunny girl, uh, you're losing your power unless the aqua goes to stock. So that's just something you need to be thinking about when you're going into your combo turn. You, typically, it's a non-issue. This deck has plenty and plenty of magic. But if you're if you having a bad game or your hands clogged, whatever you want or whatever, it can sometimes be an issue. But typically, uh, you don't need to worry about it. So next, uh, level 2s. We don't actually play any level 2 cards except for the event that I think most people know already. This is this is the scary card of Konosuba. It's, uh, it's the foreclosure. Since most people know about this card already, it's uh, not, not all that interesting to talk about. Uh, it's a opponent's attack phase stock swap. So it removes all their stock during their attack, and then they put it back at the end of their turn. Uh, some of the some of the really cool uh, use cases for this card. Uh, if your opponent is playing a climax, and they're trying to like get the climax back into their deck, you can play this, and it forces them to refresh without the climax that they played. So if you can decompress the one, essentially, which uh, can sometimes be relevant if you're trying to push a lot of damage on the next turn. The fact that it's also a it it only adds their stock at the end of turn instead of just during the attack phase, like a, like a typical stock swap, also means that it can sometimes act as anti dam like a pseudo anti damage. So if you're against like a costed finisher like a Yukina or whatever, if you hold this card, uh, Yukina can't do her climax combo unless they have the two on Sayo with the anti backup. But you don't have to work like you don't really worry about that because you can't deal with it. Overall, no, this card's really good. It it's. <laughs> It also even plays into the the end game, like the the end game combo, quote unquote, with the the set one three two aqua, where you where you play this, you stock swap them, and then you force refresh them, so you put all their stock, which is supposedly clean, back into their deck, and you hyper decompress them. Overall, it's it's a really good card. Uh, we play three because we want to see this card as fast as possible, and the fa and the fact that it's an event also means that it's a little harder. Not like a little, it's harder to get than a regular card. We can't pick it up off of our union, we can't drop search it, we can't cherry it. We have to just naturally draw it and then hold it. So that's why that's why we play three. Um, not much else to talk about, right? Uh, yeah, it's just a really good card. Uh, as soon as you see this card in your hand, you have to hold it if you're in a matchup that specifically needs it, like Bank Dream or whatever. You can't typically afford to just throw this card away willy-nilly and then try to bank on finding it later because finding it is, is completely random. You just have to draw it. However, with that said, I, I 
typically I mulligan if I if I open this card I, I'm okay with mulliganing it away and I don't feel too bad about it but I, that mainly just comes down to matchup and what my hand is at like at the time if I need to hard mulligan or whatever like typically as soon as I see this card I hold it in my hand if I need it for the matchup and I never let go it's so important and it single-handedly wins certain matchups like you can have Bang Dream or like uh Karen Review Starlight or whatever you whatever cost it finisher. It's so important you just need to hold it in your hand. So next we have our level three lineup. Uh, first card we're going to talk about is the Megumin Early Play, which is maybe the most interesting choice I made with my list for Toronto. So typically Konosuba lists try to run like three to four of this in English because their their ideal game plan is triple early play at level three with like double Megumin and Aqua or maybe even just like double Megumin one one meg uh double Megumin or just like like two early plays whatever. You're trying to just play as many early plays as you can for one stock and trying to push and go fast at level two. So I don't particularly like this game plan and that's why I'm only running the two of it because it's not my main game plan for the mid game if that makes sense so like while I think trying to push your trying to push your advantage at two with like multiple early plays is, like, is pretty good uh, the downside to that is that the fact that the Megumin touches your deck at a point in the game where you don't necessarily want to be touching your deck per se. So, uh, as I mentioned when I was like trying to talk about the zeros, this deck has a lot of melling power, and if Konosuba has like a like an average or maybe even sub average, depending on how you want to like quantify average uh, early to mid game, you end up hitting like second deck at like a reasonably compressed state. Like even potentially more so compressed than like an average deck because you're stock charging so much. So the fact that you're in a compressed deck and the Megumin early play is like touching that deck, like I, I don't I don't necessarily like that idea. Like you, when you touch your deck when you don't need to touch it, you can sometimes screw yourself over and you put yourself in like a worse spot than you need to. And uh, it can sometimes force you into situations where you have to like bail out and just try to like throw all your resources away, and mill out as much as possible because like you milled all your climaxes and you have like ten clean or whatever, or like however many clean you have, and you just need to fix your deck. So that that's mainly why I don't like it. Like I'm not trying to play the game plan of like push push uh, early plays at level two and just try to push my advantage. I'd rather try to bank on the fact that my deck's a bit more compressed and like play the awkward early play and just try to heal down and have like a more stable quote unquote i guess is how i describe it uh, mid game where uh, instead of just trying to push I, I take it slow i bank on my compression i try to heal it down and i just uh, slowly sculpt my hand for end game and just try to push as much as i can while using my uh the re while using the resonant union to uh keep my hand size efficiently honestly the f I, I i don't i don't like the mega main army play so much i actually thought about cutting the card before toronto the only reason why i actually didn't cut the early play was because the early play is particularly good into the sunshine matchup and i was expecting a lot of sunshine in toronto like uh, when sunshine plays the double early play uh, the just the make like the anti change counter or whatever isn't actually enough to deal with it. So the, this Megumin gives you an out to double early play. You play Megumin, you uh, you neg which one is it? You neg the Chica and then you just try to beat over the Yo with uh, with the Aqua or like you countered it last turn like whatever. It gives you an out to that matchup. So if you if uh, if you're not expecting like a lot of sunshine, like you can maybe potentially even just cut the Mega Main early play if you also don't like the game uh, like the game plan of just playing multiple early plays and milling your deck out at level two. And you can just play like four aqua or how whatever cards you want to add and try to play a more stabilized game, uh, level two game that I actually prefer instead of uh, the <laughs> unga bunga triple early play push deck push uh, game plan. That that's why I uh, that's why I only played two. And I think it's a. I think it was the right choice in hindsight overall. Like. I probably could have cut the early play for Toronto because I only played one Sunshine throughout the entire tournament, and the, the only Sunshine or in that match, I was able to lock Sunshine at one six. So I don't know. I barely even had to actually worry about the double early play. So it was it, the card ended up being useless, and the only time I actually played the Mega Man early play, <laughs> it, it screwed me over at level three and it, it like destroyed my deck state, and I lost the game off of it. So I'm not particularly fond of this card, but I think it's a fine card if you want to play it. If, 
if you want to play the game plan of just pushing early plays at level two and trying to push your advantage. It's per it, it's it's fine. It, it's per it's perfectly fine. It's a one stock early play, and honestly, that's good enough. So uh, next, we're playing two copies of the Burn Five Megumin from Set Two. Uh, this card gives you access to a CXS finisher, which is just always always really good. Uh, the fin Burn Five isn't particularly like a good number for trying to finish the game. But when your combo uh, decompresses them, so much as like foreclosure aqua uh, can, burn five is like a perfectly is perfectly fine. Uh, the fact that this card also plays another card for free on play is uh, it's pretty it's pretty impactful. You know, it lets you save two stock or like potentially another way to look at it is like on play you plus two stock, anyways. And I think that is like really valuable. And uh, it makes your end game turns a bit easier to manage. It also lets you, uh, it also makes managing your stock mid-game a bit more, like, easy to do. So, the fact that I only played two instead of three is because I'm trying to play more towards the Stock Soul Climax combo as my actual finisher instead of, uh, the Burn 5. So, like, if I wasn't playing the Stock Soul and I was just playing, like, eight doors and playing, like, another empty door, I'd probably try to play three of the Burn 5. Because I would, I would always want my end game to be like two burn fives and an aqua, an aqua refresher. Whereas like with this list, typically my end game is like aqua refresher, double megumin combo, or like a one burn five double megumin, like whatever combination you want to do. Like I'm not trying to play for two. I'm just trying to play for the one. So that's why I only play two. If you want to play for double, or if you're playing, uh, like if you're not playing stock soul and you're playing door, I think three is reasonable. So up next, we're playing two of the set one uh, Aqua Force Refresher. So the only, the only effect that actually matters on this card is the Force Refresh. The the anti backup during her battle is almost never relevant because you don't have power at level three outside of the uh, the burn five Megumin. So the trying to like beat over their cards or deny their backups like almost never matters. Like the only time, the only situation that I can think of off the top of my head where the no backup would matter is if you're playing against like a deck with like a sack counter and you're trying to swing for precise damage with like a side attack you can attack with the aqua and deny their sack counter to guarantee like your precise damage or whatever so it's like very limited use cases like the, the most important part is the, the force refresh so on paper when you don't like when you don't really think about it refreshing your opponent sort of sounds like a bad thing for you like you're 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 putting their climaxes back in or whatever, or like like you're making them dodge their refresh penalty so they take one less guaranteed damage. But like in actuality, the fact that you keep two climaxes out means that you typically put in more non-climax cards than climax cards, and it ends up decompressing your opponent, so they're more susceptible to take the burn five or the burn four from like your climax combo or whatever. So this means that your end game is more potent and it has a higher chance of sticking than it would normally would. And that that by itself is is already really good, but when you combine that effect with the uh, the foreclosure event or the seizure of private property, I think is the English name, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. So when you combine it with that event, it basically basically means that your opponent will always have a waiting room that you can shuffle back and decompress them with. So typically, when you're playing against like like a, like a good player or like at least like a better player than average, they try to keep their stock clean. Whenever you trigger a climax, you try to pay it out. You want to keep your stock clean because stock is a form of compression. So the fact that you have access to like a stock swap means that you can always guarantee that your opponent will have clean cards to put back in the waiting room, like. Uh, like if they get into a situation where like like they're they're two they mill out at two five and then they refresh at two six and they don't have a waiting room and you're trying to kill them on that turn, like the aqua doesn't necessarily do anything. But if you play the event on your main phase and you put their stock into their waiting room, you can guarantee decompress them. So it makes it so this um, the aqua is always turned on and it's always just a powerful card. Uh, you can even even like if you use foreclosure on like the opponent's turn uh, on the turn before you're doing your kill turn. You same thing. You put their clean stock, like supposedly clean stock, into the waiting room, so you guarantee that you can decompress them, and then you can even like decompress them even even further with the event by by making them stock like whatever their deck, the top of the deck is like whatever. Like the fact that these you have both these cards and you can use them in tandem on the same turn means that you can always have a, a good kill turn, and you can always and you can always decompress them. You can try to kill them from like a range that you normally wouldn't be able to, and you can sort of steal games. That you necessarily shouldn't be winning, and I think that's 
what makes Konosuba as powerful as it is, honestly. So even though this card is super powerful, we're only actually playing two because you only ever want to play the one on board. Like the fact that this card only has one relevant effect means you never want to see more than one copy. So two, two is perfectly fine. You pick it up in the mid game and then you just hold it in your hand until you get to your end game and then you ignore the other copy. You don't want any more because it's taking up slots that can go to better cards. <laughs> So next, uh, we're playing three of the Aqua Early Play. So this is just a card that we can always play a level two to make sure we have a two soul beater that can beat over their two soul beaters. Like, as I mentioned at level zero, not killing your opponent's cards is like, typically a bad thing because you're giving them free pluses, which converts into free resources for them. So having a card that's like offensively strong and can beat over like big two ones or like even opponent early plays, it's just good to have. The fact that it's a healer at level 2 means it can help you slow down the game a little bit. So Konosuba doesn't really run a lot of healers, and then when it hits level 3, it tries to play to kill the opponent with its like super powerful endgame instead of just try to heal down and live. So being able to heal at 2 and like try to stay at 2 a little bit longer and set up your endgame combo is very valuable. It's extremely valuable. The fact that it's uh, like even like a ditch heal to stock you know, is kind of relevant for English, I guess. Like KC is a, a relatively big deck that has anti heal, so you don't even have to worry about like anti heal. You can always heal. Um, heal to stock means that if you're like if you're playing a game and you have high hand, low stock, you have like a cost effective healer. Uh, if you have like average hand, um, de semi decent stock from like your bunny girl combo, whatever, you can use that union stock from your heal to like, get a card back into your hand. So it can just like essentially be like a regular healer that you can play every single turn. Honestly, it's a really good card. I actually prefer playing this as my early play over the Mega Man, like I said earlier. Like, like I, I was considering playing four. I opted not into it. I just think I think it's Aqua is just a really good card to have overall. So finally, the the last card in the list that we're gonna talk about is just the three two Mega Man from set one, the Stock Soul combo. <laughs> This card is, it, it's interesting, it's interesting. When like you read the Climax combo, like it doesn't necessarily sound like it's like a particularly good Climax combo. Like like pay four, or sorry, pay one, burn four, like isn't like all that strong. Like burn four isn't a very good number. But when you have effects like the Aqua Force Refresh and the Stock Swap event, it makes it, so this is actually like a, a pretty powerful climb, like end game, end game finishing option. The fact that you, you don't have to also interact with your opponent, you do it at the start of your attack phase, and you don't care what your opponent has, like you don't you don't have to worry about backwards or whatever, it's also pretty important. Uh, it makes it so you can like, guarantee to have your finishing turn, quote unquote. Uh, the clock kick also can guarantee, guarantee specific damage, so you can try to get per more precise swings in to try to finish your turn, try to finish your opponent with the burn five mega meme. Uh, it, it can trips, so you can help you find your, uh, find your CXs, all in all, it's just a really good card. Really good card going forward. Like especially with some of like the newer sets that are coming out, I think that this climax combo actually sort of gets more value going forward. Like um like when it, if uh, for whatever reason like Bonnie Girl Senpai sort of like picks up and your and your uh, your opponent sets up like the Futaba bodyguard, this gives you like a super clean out to the Futaba bodyguard, so you don't even have to worry about it. Like that card becomes a non-factor. Uh, if like your if Goblin Slayer picks up and they, your opponent plays Priestess, this card gives you an out to Priestess, that you, and you don't even have to worry about the next soul. It also gives you an out to just like regular minus soul decks like Arisa or uh, Cardcaptor Sakura if they still play Siege for whatever reason. Honestly, it's just. It's just pretty good. It's a pretty good card going going forward with the meta, and I think if Konosuba is going to stick around, it's gonna to have to try. It's gonna to have to swap off of the empty gate and play the stock soul, so you have better better finishing power. Another thing to note with the uh, with playing the stock soul or combo over like like an empty door, this actually gives you like a bit more of a flexible uh, like finishing turn. So like, like as you can see in the deck, you have like a couple different options, like a couple different lines that you could take to try to finish your opponent, because you're playing the Soxo combo. If you weren't playing the Soxo combo, your finishing turn is almost always like burn five, burn five Fumio, or sorry, burn five, burn five Aqua Refresher. But with the Soxo combo, you can try to like customize your damage a little bit. You, you can do like a burn five combo, combo, Aqua combo, combo, triple combo, like whatever. Like you have options to try to play the best finishing turn that you can do for whatever the situation is and that I think is uh, pretty powerful. So 
that's the deck. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully you find this video uh, educational. I went into a bit more detail than I was expecting to originally, so hopefully this video doesn't end up being uh, too long. Turns people away, hopefully, and whatever. Uh, if you guys have any questions or whatever, feel free to just message me or like, leave a comment in the video. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, if you want anything more, just let us, uh, any more Weiss content, just let us know. We'll be happy to make it. So, again, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.